Welcome. This is an audio reading of The System of Dr. Tar and Professor Feather by Edgar Allan Poe, published 1856. Let us begin. During the autumn of 1842, while on tour through the extreme southern provinces of France, my route led me within a few miles of a certain Maison de Sante, or private madhouse, about which I had heard much in Paris from my medical friends. As I had never visited a place of the kind, I thought the opportunity too good to be lost, and so proposed to my traveling companion, a gentleman with whom I had made casual acquaintance a few days before, that we should turn aside for an hour or so and look through the establishment. To this he objected, pleading haste in the first place, and in the second, a very usual horror at the sight of a lunatic. He begged me, however, not to let any mere courtesy towards himself interfere with the gratification of my curiosity, and said that he would ride on leisurely, so that I might overtake him during the day, or, at all events, during the next. As he bade me goodbye, I bethought me that there might be some difficulty in obtaining access to the premises, and mentioned my fears on this point. He replied that, in fact, unless I had personal knowledge of the superintendent, Monsieur Mallard, or some credential in the way of a letter, a difficulty might be found to exist, as the regulations of these private madhouses were more rigid than the public hospital laws. For himself, he added, he had some years since made the acquaintance of Mallard, and would so far assist me as to ride up to the door and introduce me, although his feelings on the subject of lunacy would not permit of his entering the house. I thanked him, and turning from the main road, we entered a grass grown by a path which, in half an hour, nearly lost itself in a dense forest, clothing the base of a mountain. Through this dank and gloomy wood, we rode some two miles when the Maison de Saint came in view. It was a fantastic chateau, much depleted, much dilapidated, and indeed scarcely tentable through age and neglect. Its aspect inspired me with absolute dread, and, checking my horse, I half resolved to turn back. I soon, however, grew ashamed of my weakness, and proceeded. As we rode up to the gateway, I perceived it slightly open, and the visage of a man peering through. In an instant forward, this man came forth, accosted my companion by name, shook him cordially by the hand, and begged him to alight. It was Monsieur Millard himself. He was a portly, fine-looking gentleman of the old school, with a polished manner and a certain air of gravity, dignity, and authority, which was very impressive. My friend, having presented me, mentioned my desire to inspect the establishment, and received Monsieur Mallard's assurance that he would show me all attention. I now took leave, and I saw him no more. When he had gone, the superintendent ushered me into a small and exceedingly neat parlor, containing among the other indications of refined taste, many books, drawings, pots of flowers, and musical instruments. A cheerful fire blazed upon the hearth. At a piano, singing an aria from Bellini, sat a young and very beautiful woman who, at my entrance, paused in her song and received me with grateful courtesy. Her voice was low and her whole manner subdued. I thought, too, that I perceived the traces of sorrow in her countenance, which was excessively although to my taste, not unpleasingly pale. She was attired in deep mourning and excited in my bosom a feeling of mingled respect, interest, and admiration. I had heard at Paris that the institution of Monsieur Millard was managed upon what is vulgarly termed the system of soothing, that all punishments were avoided that even confinement was seldom resorted to, that the patients, while secretly watched, were left much apparent liberty, and that most of them were permitted to roam about the house and grounds in the ordinary apparel of persons of right mind. Keeping these impressions in view, I was cautious in what I said before the young lady, for I could not be sure that she was sane, and in fact there was a certain restless brilliancy about her eyes which half led me to imagine she was not. I confined my remarks, therefore, to general topics, and to such as I thought would not be displeasing or exciting even to a lunatic. 
She replied in a perfectly rational manner to all that I said, and even her original observations were marked with the soundest good sense. But a long acquaintance with the metaphysics of mania had taught me to put no faith in such evidence of sanity, and I continued to practice. Throughout the interview, the caution with which I commenced it. Presently, a smart footman in livery brought me in a tray with fruit, wine, and other refreshments, of which I partook. The lady soon after leaving the room. As she departed, I turned my eyes in an inquiring manner toward my host. No, he said. Oh, no. A member of my family, my niece, and a most accomplished woman. I beg a thousand pardons for the suspicion, I replied, but of course you will know how to excuse me. The excellent administration of your affairs here is well understood in Paris, and I thought it just possible, you know. Yes, yes, say no more, or rather it is myself who should thank you for the commendable prudence you have displayed. We seldom find so much of forethought in young men, and more than once some unhappy contrary attempts has occurred in consequence of thoughtlessnesses on the part of our visitors. While my former system was in operation, and my patients were permitted the privilege of roaming to and fro at will, they were often aroused to a dangerous frenzy by injudicious persons who called to inspect the house. Hence, I was obliged to enforce a rigid system of exclusion, and none obtained access to the premises, upon whose discretion I could not rely. While your former system was in operation, I said, repeating his words, do I understand you, then, to say that the soothing system of which I heard so much is no longer in force? It is now, he replied, several weeks since we have concluded to renounce it forever. Indeed, you astonish me. We found it, sir, he said with a sigh, absolutely necessary to return to the old usages. The danger of the soothing system was, at all times, appalling, and its advantages have been much overrated. I believe, sir, that in this house it has been given a fair trial, if ever in any. We did everything that rational humanity could suggest. I am sorry that you could not have paid us a visit at an earlier period, that you might have judged for yourself. But I presume you are conversant with the soothing practice, with its details. Not altogether. What I have heard has been at third or fourth hand. I may state the system then, in general terms, as one in which the patients were menages humored. We contradicted no fancies which entered the brains of the mad. On the contrary, we not only indulged but encouraged them, and many of our most permanent cures had been thus effected. There is no argument which so touched the feeble, per feeble reason of the madman as the argumentum ad absurdum. We have had men, for example, who fancy themselves chickens. The cure was to insist upon the thing as a fact. To accuse the patients of stupidity is not sufficiently perceiving it to be a fact, and thus to reuse him any other diet for a week than that which properly appertains to a chicken. In this manner, a little corn and gravel were made to perform wonders. But was this species of acquiescence all? By no means. We put much faith in amusements of a simple kind, such as music, dancing, gymnastic exercises generally, cards, certain classes of books, and so forth, we are effected to treat each individual as if for some ordinary physical disorder, and the word lunacy was never employed. A great point was to set each lunatic to guard the actions of all the others, to repose confidence in the understanding or discretion of a madman, is to gain him body and soul. In this way, we were enabled to dispense with an expensive body of keepers. And you had no punishments of any kind? None! And you you'd never confined your patients? Very rarely, now and then. 
the malady of some individuals growing to a crisis or taking a sudden turn of fury, we conveyed him to a secret cell, lest his disorder should infect the rest, and there kept him until we could dismiss him to his friends. For with the raging maniac we have nothing to do. He is usually removed to the public hospitals. And you have now changed all this, and you think for the better? Decidedly. The system had its disadvantages and even its dangers. It is now, happily, exploded throughout all the Maison de Saint of France. I am very much surprised, I said. And what you tell me, for I made sure that at this moment no other method of treatment for mania existed in any portion of the country. You are a young gent, my friend, replied my host. But the time will arrive when you will learn to judge for yourself of what is going on in the world, without trusting to the gossip of others. Believe nothing you hear, and only one half that you see. Now we're about our Maison de Saint, it is clear that some ignoramus has misled you. After dinner, however, when you have sufficiently recovered from the fatigue of your ride, I will be happy to take you over to the house and introduce you to a system which, in my opinion, and in that of everyone who has witnessed this operation, is incomparably the most effectual as yet devised. Your own? I inquired. One of your invention? I am proud to acknowledge that this is it, at least in some measure. In this manner, I conversed with Monsieur Malade for about an hour or two, during which he showed me the gardens and conservatories of the place. I cannot let you see my patients, he said. Just at present, to a sensitive mind, there is always more or less of the shocking in such exhibitions, and I do not wish to spoil your appetite for dinner. We will dine. I can give you some veal à la menorte with cauliflowers and velvet sauce, and that a glass of Clos de Vogue. Then your nerves will be sufficiently steadied. At six, dinner was announced, and my host conducted me into a large cell a manager, where very numerous company was asse were assembled. Twenty-five or thirty in all, they were apparently people of rank, certainly of high breeding, although their habiliments, I thought, were extravagantly rich, partaking too much of the ostentatious finery of the Vale Corps. I noticed at least two-thirds of these guests were ladies, and some of the latter were by no means accoutred in what a Parisian would consider good taste at the present day. Many females, for example, whose age could not have been less than seventy, were bedecked with a profusion of jewelry, such as rings, bracelets, and earrings, and wore their bosoms and arms shamefully bare. I observed, too, that very few of the dresses were well made, or at least that very few of them fitted the wearers. And looking about, I discovered the interesting girl to whom Monsieur Malad had presented me in the little parlor. But my surprise was great to see her wearing a hoop and farthing gal with high-heeled shoes and a dirty cap of Brussels lace, so much too large for her that it gave her face a ridiculously diminutive expression. When I had first seen her, she was attired, but most becomingly in deep mourning. There was an air of oddity, in short, about the dress of the whole party, which at first caused me to recur to my original idea that the soothing system and to fancy that Monsieur Malard had been willing to deceive me until after dinner, that I might experience no uncomfortable feelings during the repast. At finding myself dining with lunatics, but I remembered having been informed in Paris that the southern provincialists were a peculiarly eccentric people with a vast number of antiquated notions, and then, too, upon conversing with several members of the company, my apprehensions were immediately and fully dispelled. The dining room itself, although perhaps sufficiently comfortable and of good dimensions, had nothing too much of elegance about it. For example, the floor was uncarpeted. In France, however, a carpet is frequently dispensed with. 
The windows, too, were without curtains, the shutters being shut, were securely fastened with iron bars, applied diagonally after the fashion of our ordinary shop shutters. The apartment, I observed, formed in itself a wing of the chateau, and thus the windows were on three sides of the parallelogram, the door being at the other. There were no less than ten windows in all. The table was superbly set out. It was loaded with plates and more than loaded with delicacies. The profusion was absolutely barbaric. There were meats enough to have feasted the anakim. Never in all my life had I witnessed so lavish, so wasteful an expenditure of the good things of life. There seemed very little taste, however, in the arrangements, and my eyes, accustomed to quiet lights, were sadly offended by the prodigious glare of a multitude of wax candles which, in a silver candelabra, were deposited upon the table and all about the room, wherever it was possible to find a place. There were several active servants in attendance, and upon a large table at the farther end of the apartment were seated seven or eight people with fiddles, fifes, trombones, and a drum. These fellows annoyed me very much. At intervals during the repast, by an infinite variety of noises which were intended for music, and which appeared to afford much entertainment to all present, with the exception of myself. Upon the whole, I could not help thinking that there was much of the bizarre about everything I saw. But then the world is made up of all kinds of persons, with all modes of thought and all sorts of conventional customs I had traveled to, so much as to be quite an adept at the nil adimariae. So I took my seat very coolly at the right hand of my host, and having an excellent appetite, did justice to the good cheer set before me. The conversation in the meantime was spirited in general. The ladies, as usual, talked a great deal. I soon found that nearly all the company were well educated, and my host was a world of good humored antidotes in himself. He seems quite willing to speak of his position as a superintendent of a Maison de Saint, and indeed the topic was lunacy. of lunacy was, much to my surprise, a favorite with all present. A great many amusing stories were told, having reference to the whims of the patients. We had a fellow here once, said a fat little gentleman who sat at my right, a fellow that fancied himself a teapot, and by the way, it is not especially singular how often this particular crotchet had entered the brain of the lunatic. There is scarcely an insane asylum in France which cannot supply a human teapot. Our gentleman was a Britannia. Wear teapot, and he was careful to polish himself every morning with buckskin and whiting. And then, said a tall man just opposite, we had here not long ago a person who had taken it into his head that he was a donkey, which allegorically speaking, you will say, was quite true. He was a troublesome patient, and we had much ado to keep him within bounds. For a long time he would eat nothing but thistles, but of this idea we soon cured him by insisting upon his eating nothing else. Then he was perpetually kicking out his heels so-so. M Mr. D. Cock, I will thank you to behave yourself. Here interrupted an old lady who sat next to the speaker. Please keep your feet to yourself. You have spoiled my brocade. Is it necessary, pray, to illustrate a remark in so practical a style? Our friend here can surely comprehend you without all this. Upon my word, you are nearly as great as a donkey as the poor unfortunate imagined himself. Your acting is very natural, as I live. Mille pardon, my amicelle, replied Monsieur de Coq. A thousand pardons. I had no intention of offending, my amicelle Laplace. Monsieur de Coq will do himself the honor of taking wine with you. Here Monsieur de Coq bowed low, kissed his hand with much ceremony, and took wine with Mamselle Laplace. Allow me, mon ami, that said Monsieur Malade, addressing myself, allow me to send you a morsel of this veal à la saint Malot. You will find it particularly fine. At this instant, three sturdy waiters had just succeeded in depositing 
safely upon the table at an enormous dish or trencher containing what I supposed to be supposed to be the monstrum horrendum informe ingenes culumin adeptum. A closer scrutiny should be, however, that it was only a small calf roasted whole and set upon its knees with an apple in its mouth, as if the English fashion of dressing a hare. Uh, thank you, no, uh, I replied. To say the truth, I am not particularly partial to a veal a la saint. What is it? For I do not find that it altogether agrees with me. I will change my plate, however, and try some of the rabbits. There were several side dishes on the table, containing what appeared to be the ordinary French rabbit, a very delicious morceau, which I can recommend. Pierre, cried the host, change this gentleman's plate and give him a side piece of this rabbit a shot. This what, I said? This rabbit a shot. Oh, why, thank you. Upon second thoughts, no, uh, I will just help myself to some of the ham. There is no knowing what one eats, thought I to myself. At the tables of these people of the province, I will have none of their rabbit asha to, and for that matter of that, none of their cat owl rabbit rabbits either. And then, said a cadaverous looking personage near the foot of the table, taking up the thread of the conversation when it had broken off, and then, among other oddities, we had a patient once upon a time who very pertinaciously maintained himself to be a Cordova cheese and went about with a knife in his hand soliciting his friends to try a small slice from the middle of his leg. He was a great fool, uh, beyond doubt, interposed someone. But not to be compared with a certain individual whom we all know, with the exception of this strange gentleman. I mean, the man who took himself for a bottle of champagne and always went off with a pop and a fizz in this fashion. Here the speaker very rudely, as I thought, put his right thumb and his left cheek, withdrew it with a sound resembling the popping of a cork, and then by a, a dexterous movement of the tongue upon the teeth created a sharp hissing and fizzing, which lasted for several minutes, in imitation of the frothing of champagne. This behavior, I saw plainly, was not very pleasing to Monsieur Mallard, but the gentleman said nothing, and the conversation was resumed by a very little man in a big wig. And then there was an agramus, said he, who mistook himself for a frog, which, by the way, he resembled in little no degree, I wish you could have seen him, sir. Here, the, the speaker addressed myself. It would have done your heart good to see the natural airs that he put on. Sir, if that man was not a frog, I can only observe that it was a pity he was not. His croak, thus, ooh, ooh, was the finest note in the world. Be flat. And when he put his elbows upon the table, thus, after taking a glass or two of wine, and distended his mouth, thus, and rolled up his eyes, thus, and winked them with excessive rapidity, thus, why then, sir? I take it upon myself to say positively that you would have been lost in admiration of the genius of this man. I have no doubt of it, I said. And then, said somebody else, then there was Petit Gallard, who taught himself a pinch of snuff, and was truly distressed because he could not take upon himself between his own finger and thumb. And then there was Jules de Soros, who was, very, who was a very singular genius indeed, and went mad with the idea that he was a pumpkin. He persecuted the cook to make him up into pies, a thing which the cook indignantly refused to do. For my part, I am by no means sure that the pumpkin pie a la de Clos would not have been a, been a very capital eating indeed. You astonish me, said I, and I looked inquisitively at Monsieur Millard. <laughs> said the gentleman. He 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 he. Very good indeed. You must not be astonished, mon ami. Our friend here is a wit, a droll. You must not understand him to the letter. And then, said some of the party, 
Then there was the Buffon Legrand, another extraordinary personage in his way. He grew the reins through love and fancied himself possessed of two heads. One of these he maintained to be the head of Cicero, the other he imagined a composite one being the Mosthenes from the top of the forehead to the mouth, and Lord Brogham from the mouth to the chin. It is not impossible that he was wrong, but he would have convinced you of his being in the right. For he was a man of great eloquence, he had an absolute passion for oratory, and could not refrain from display. For, for example, he used to leap upon the dinner table thus, and, uh... Here a friend, at the side of the speaker, put a hand upon his shoulder, and whispered a few words in his ears, upon which he ceased talking about with great suddenness, and sank back with his share. And then, said the friend who had whispered, there was blood, the teetotal. I called him the teetotal because, in fact, he was seized with the drove, but not altogether irrational crotchet, that he had been converted into a teetotum. He you would have roared with laughter to see him spin. He would have turned round upon one hill by the hour of this man or so. Here the friend, who he had just interrupted by whisper, performed an exactly similar similar office for himself. But then, cried the old lady at the top of her voice, your Monsieur Boulard was a madman, and a very silly madman at best, for who, let me to ask you, ever heard of a human titom? Uh, the thing is absurd. Madame Jussoy was a more sensible person, as you know. She had a crotchet, uh, but he was instinct with common sense, uh, and gave pleasure to all who had the honor of her acquaintance. She found upon mature deliberation that by some accident she had been turned into a chicken cock, but as such she behaved in propriety. She flapped her wings with prodigious effect. So, so, as for the, her crow, it was delicious. Madam Joyce, I will take you to behave yourself here, interrupted our host very angrily. You can either conduct yourself as a lady should do, or you can quit the table forthwith, take your choice. The lady, oh, who I was much astonished to hear addressed as Madame Joyce, after the description of Madame Joyce she had just given, blushed up to her eyebrows and seemed exceedingly abashed at the reproof. She hung down her head and said not a syllable in reply, but another and younger lady resumed the theme. It was my beautiful girl of the little part. Oh, Madame Joyce was a fool, she exclaimed. But there was really much sound sense after all in the opinion of Eugene Salas Fit. She was a very beautiful and painfully modest young lady who thought the ordinary mode of the habiliment incident and wished to dress herself always by getting outside instead of inside her clothes. It is a thing very easily done, after all. You only have to do so, and then so, so, and then so, so, and then so, so, and then... My dear, my Michel Savard, he cried a dozen voices at once. What are you about? Forbear. That is sufficient. We see very plainly how it's done. Hold, hold, and several persons were already leaping from their seats to withhold Mademoiselle Salisfaz from putting herself upon a par with the Venetian Venus, when the point was very effectually suddenly accomplished by a series of loud screams or yells from some portion of the main body of the chateau. My nerves were very much affected, indeed, by these yells, but the rest of the company I really pitied. I never saw any set of reasonable people so thoroughly frightened in my life. They all grew as pale as so many corpses, and shrinking within their seats, sat quivering and glibbering with terror, and listened for a repetition of the, of, of the sound. It came again, louder and seemingly nearer, and then a third time, very loud, and then a fourth time, with a vigor evidently diminished. As the parent dying away of the noise, the spirits of the company were immediately regained, and all the life and antidotes as before. I now venture to acquire the cause of the disturbance. Emir Bactel, said Monsieur Millard, we are used to these things, who, and care really very little about them. The lunatics, every now and then, get up by howling in concerts, one starting another, as in sometimes the case, with a bevy of dogs at night. It occasionally happens. Uh, however, the, the concerto yells are succeeded by a simultaneous effort at breaking loose, and, of course, some little danger is to be apprehended. 
And how many have you in charge? At the present, we have not more than ten altogether. Principally females, I presume. Oh no, every one of them men and stout fellows too, I can tell you. Indeed, I have always understood that the majority of lunatics were of the gentler sex. It is generally so, but not always. Some time ago, there were about 27 patients here, and of that number, no less than 18 were women. But lately, matters have changed very much, as you see. Yes, uh, have changed very much, as you see, interrupted the gentleman who broke the shins, who had broken the shins of Mayam Sal Laplace. Yes, have changed very much, as you see, chimed in the whole company at once. Hold your tongues, every one of you, said my host in a great rage, whereupon the whole company maintained a dead silence for nearly a minute. As for one lady, she obeyed one serum aloud to the latter, and thrusting out her tongue, which was an excessively long one, held it very residingly with both hands until the end of the unseen. And this gentlewoman, uh, said I to Monsieur Millard, bending over and addressing him in a whisper, this good lady who has just spoken and who gives us the cock a doodle doo doo, she I presume is harmless? Quite harmless, eh? Harmless! ejaculated he in an unfeigned surprise. Why, why, what, what can you mean? Only slightly touched, uh, said I, in such a way. I, I take it for granted that she is not particularly, not dangerously affected, eh? Mon Dieu, what is it you imagine? This lady, uh, my particular old friend, the Madame Joyce, says, as uh, absolutely sane as myself. She has a little eccentricities, to be sure, but then, uh, you know, all old women, all very old women, are more or less eccentric. To be sure said I, uh, to be sure, and then the rest of these ladies and gentlemen are my friends and keepers, interrupted Monsieur Millard, drawing himself upon with a hauteur. My very good friends and assistants. What? All of them? I asked. The woman and all? Assuredly. We cannot do at all without the women. They are the best lunatic nurses in the world. And they have a way of their own, you know. Their bright eyes have a marvelous effect. Something like the fascination of the snake, uh, you know. T to be sure, to be sure, D they behave a little odd, eh? They're a little queer, eh? Don't you think so? Odd? Queer? Why, why do you really think so? We are not very prudish, uh, to be sure, here in the South. Do pretty much as we please, enjoy life, and all the sorts of things, you know? To be sure. To be sure. And then perhaps... This close divog is a little heady, you know, a little strong. You understand that? To be sure, uh, to be sure. Uh, by the by, Monsieur, did I understand you to say that the system you have you have adopted in a place of the celebrated students was one of very rigorous severity? By no means. Our confinement is necessary close, but the treatment, the medical treatment, I mean, is rather agreeable to the patients than otherwise. And the new system is one of your own invention. Not altogether. Some portions of it are referable to Professor Tarr, of whom you have necessarily heard, and uh, again, there are modifications in my plan, which I am happy to acknowledge as belonging of right uh, to the celebrated feather, with whom, if I mistake not, you have the honor of an intimate acquaintance. I am quite ashamed to confess that I have never even heard uh, the names of either gentleman before. Good heavens! Uh, uh, drawing his back his chair abruptly and lift, uplifting his hands, I, I surely do not hear you all right. You did not intend to say uh, that you have never heard either of the learned Dr. Tarr or of the celebrated Professor Feather. <laughs> I'm forced to acknowledge my ignorance, I but the truth should be held inviolate above all things. Nevertheless, I feel humbled to the dust not to be acquainted with the uh, works of these, no doubt, extraordinary men. I will seek at their writings forthwith and uh, pursue them with liberal care. Monsieur Malad, you have really, I must confess, you have really uh, made me ashamed of myself. And this was fact. Say no more, my good young friend. Join me now in a glass of southern... We drank, the company followed our example without stint, they chatted, they jested, they laughed, they perpetrated a thousand absurdities, 
The fiddles shriek, the drum road the road, the trombones bell like so many brazen bulls of Phalaris, and the whole scene growing gradually worse and worse as the wines gained the ascendancy became at length a sort of pandemonium in petto. In the meantime, Monsieur Millard and myself, with some bottles of Saturn and voyaged between us, continued our conversation at the top of the voice, a word spoken in an, in an ordinary case that no more chance of being heard than the voice of a fish from the bottom of Niagara Falls. And, sir, you mentioned something before dinner about the danger incurred in the old system of soothing. How is that? Yes, sir, there was occasionally very great danger indeed. There is no accounting for the caprices of madmen, and in my opinion, as well as in the, that of Dr. Tarr and Professor Feather, it is never safe to put them to run at large and attempt. A lunatic may be soothed, as it's called, for a time, but in the end he is very apt to become uh, obstreperous. His cunning, too, is proverbial and great. If he, was ha if he has a project in view, he conceals his design with a marvelous wisdom, and the dexterity which he counts for sanity presents to the beneficent uh, one of the most singular problems in the study of mind. When a madman appears thoroughly sane, indeed, it is high time to put him in a straitjacket. But the danger, my dear sir, of which you are speaking in your own experience during your control of this house, have you had practical reasons to think liberty hazardous in the case of the lunatic? Here, in my own experience, why, I, I may say, uh, yes, uh, for example, no, no very long while ago, a singular circumstance occurred in this very house. Uh, the soothing system, you know, was then in operations, and the patients were at large. They behaved remarkably well, especially so, and any of my sense might have known that some devilish scheme was brewing from the particular fact that the fellows behaved so remarkably well. And uh, sure enough, one fine morning, the keepers found themselves pinioned hand and foot and thrown through the cells where they were attended as if they were the lunatics and by the lunatics themselves who had usurped the offices of the keepers. You don't tell me so. I've never heard of anything so absurd in my life. In fact, it all came to pass by means of a stupid fellow, a lunatic, who by some means had taken it into his head that he had invented a better system of government than he ever heard before. A lunatic government, I mean. He wished to give his invention a trial, I, I suppose, and so he persuaded the rest of the patients to join him in a conspiracy for the overthrow of the reigning powers. <laughs> he really succeeded? Uh, no doubt of it. Uh, the keepers and the kept were soon made to exchange places. Not that, that exactly either, for the madman had been free, but the keepers were shut up in cells fort and treated, I am sorry to say, in a very cavalier manner. <sighs> But I presume a counter-revolution was soon effected. This condition of the things could not have long existed. Uh, the country people and the neighborhood uh, visitors coming to see the establishments would have given the alarm. There, you are out. The head rebel was too cunning for that. He admitted no visitors at all, with the exception one day of a very stupid-looking gentleman of whom he had no reason to be afraid. He let him in to see the place, just by way of variety, to have a little fun with him. Uh, as soon as he had uh, gammoned him sufficiently, he let him out and set him about his business. Uh, 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 and how, how long then did the madman reign? Oh, a very long time indeed. Uh, a month, certainly. How yeah, much longer I can't precisely say. In the meantime, the lunatics had a jolly season of it. That you may swear, they doffed their own shabby clothes and made free with the family wardrobes and jewels. The cellars of the chateau were well stocked with wine, and these madmen are just the devils that know how to drink. They lived well, like I tell you. And, and the treatment, what was that particular species of treatment which the leader of the rebels put into operation? Why, as for that, a madman is not necessarily a fool, as I have already observed, and it is my honest opinion that this treatment was a much better treatment than that which it superseded. It was a very capital system indeed, simple, neat, uh, no trouble at all. In fact, it was delicious. It was. Here, my host's observations were cut short by another series of veil of the same character as those which had previously disconcerted us. This time, however, they seemed to proceed from persons rapidly approaching. Great heavens! The lunatics have most undoubtedly broken loose. I very much fear so, replied my lord. Now becoming excessively pale, he had scarcely finished the sentence before loud shouts and imprecations were heard beneath the windows, and immediately after it became evident that some persons outside were endeavoring to gain entrance to the room. The door was beaten, and what appeared to be a sledgehammer, and the shutters were wrenched and shaken with prodigious violence. 
I see him in the most terrible confusion suit, Monsieur Malad, to my excessive astonishment, threw himself under the sideboard. I expected more resolution at his hands. The members of the orchestra, who for the last 15 minutes had been seemingly too much attacked against the duty, now sprang all at once to their feet, and their instruments and scrambled upon their table, broke out one accord into Yankee Doodle, which they performed, if not exactly in tune, at least with an energy superhuman during the whole of the uproar. Meanwhile, upon the main dining table, among the bottles and glasses, leaped the gentleman who, with such difficulty, had been restrained from leaping there before. As soon as he fairly settled himself, he commenced an oration which, no doubt, was a very capital one. If it could not only have been heard at the same moment, the man with the teetotum predilocation set himself into spinning around the apartment with immense energy and with arms that stretched at right angles with his body, so that he had all the air of a teetotum, in fact, and knocked everybody down that happened to get in his way. And now, too, hearing an incredible popping of physical champagne, I discovered at length that it proceeded from the person who performed the bottle of the delicate drink during dinner. And then again, the frogwing cro croaked away as if in salivation of a soul dependent on every note of that he uttered. And in the midst of all this, the brain of a donkey rose over all. As for all my old friend, Madame Joyce, I really could have wept for the poor old lady. She appeared so terribly perplexed. All she did, however, was stand up in a corner by the fireplace and sing out, and suddenly at the top of her voice, cock a doodle doo! And now came the climax the catastrophe of the drama. And no resistance beyond the whooping and yelling and cock doodling was offered to the encroachments of the party without. The ten windows were very speedily and almost simultaneously broken in. But I shall not forget the emotions of wonder and horror with which I gazed when leaping through these windows and down among us pele mele, fighting, stamping, scratching, and howling, there rushed a perfect army of what I looked to, to be chimpanzees, orangutans, or big black baboons of the Cape of Good Hope. I received a terrible beating, after which I rolled under the sofa and lay still. <sighs> after lying there some fifteen minutes, during which time I listened to all my ears to what was going on in the room, I came to the satisfactory denouncement of this tragedy. Monsieur Mallard, it appeared, in giving me the account of the lunatic who had excited his fellows to rebellion, had been merely relating his own exploits. <sighs> this gentleman had indeed... <sighs> Some two or three years before, I've been the superintendent of the establishment, but grew crazy himself, and so became a patient. This fact was unknown, so the traveling companion introduced me. The keepers, ten in number, have been suddenly overpowered, were first well tarred and then carefully feathered, and then shut up in the underground cells. They had been in prison for more than a month, during which period Monsieur Millet had generously allowed them not only the tar and feathers which constituted the system, but some bread and abundance of water. The latter was pumped on them daily. At length, the one escaping through a sewer gave freedom to all the rest. The soothing system, when important modifications had been resumed at the chateau. Yet I, ca I cannot help agreeing with Monsieur Millard that his own treatment was a very capital one of its kind. And he justly observed it was simple, neat, and gave no trouble at all, not the least. I have only to add that, although I have searched every library in Europe for the works of Dr. Tarr and Professor Feather, I have, up to present day, utterly failed in my endeavors at procuring an edition.